everything that we do, I'm making at Rabbi Tay. Rabbi Tay, this week's shiur is going to be a little bit different. Usually, every week, we go straight, take a mitzvah, we continue with our order, and we take, I see a lot of new faces, I will explain a few minutes on what this shiur is. This shiur is essentially Rabbi Tay taking mitzvot, taking the tefillah, taking things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis, that we're taught to do and repeat and do and repeat, but never explained why, and never explained what it does up there, and never explained what's the reward for all these things that we do. So this year we take the mitzvot, the prayers that we do on a daily basis, that no one ever explains to us why we do it, and we give it a deeper look into our mitzvot and into our Torah. And hopefully by doing so, Be'ezat Hashem, we will have more of, a, more of a love, more of a, a strength to follow in the Torah and to follow in its steps. Amen, Kenyan. Abutai, today is the Ilula. To say the tzaddik is to make it sound small. Of the tzaddik, Arizal. Arizal is not his name, actually. His name is Rabbi Yitzchak Luria Ashkenazi. That his uh, acronym is Ari. And Zal is the Chonol Levracha. Abutai, to try to start to explain who is Arizal, like I was speaking to someone before the shoe, is very hard. To try to explain what was Arizal, what did he stand for, what, what, he, what was he as a tzaddik, is nearly impossible. But we can start to try. So to start at Abotai, with every tzaddik, if you want to understand who he was, we go to look at the books that he wrote. Arizal was the tzaddik who put together the eight gates. So what is the eight gates? The eight gates is one of the deepest ways of studying Kabbalah, which is essentially the Zohar Kadosh in a deeper look, which is incredible. Because we know the Zohar is already such a deep study. The eight gates takes the Zohar and explains it in a deeper way, in a way that with more detail, in a way that, that goes one layer under, deeper, which is incredible. That Abotai is to start. Arizal, it said that every single night, he studied with who? He studied with Eliyahu Navi. That his chavruta, when you go to a yeshiva, you see two people studying, his chavruta was Eliyahu Navi. That every night he had a room, Eliyahu Navi would come and they would sit and they would study. Rabbi Chaim Vital, which was his main student, witnesses on him that there wasn't one thing of Torah, there wasn't a drop of Torah, of knowledge that Rabbi Ariya Kadosh did not hold at one shot. That Arizal knew everything. There wasn't a secret, there wasn't a drop of Torah that Arizal did not know by heart. It said that one day on Shabbat, Arizal, he was tired from the whole night study. So while they were studying, he took a couple of minutes to sleep. And while he was sleeping for a few minutes, Abichai Vital, he sees his lips moving. He sees his eyes are closed, but the Arizal's lips are talking. So Abichai Vital, who is actually the, one of our great grandfathers, he said, you know what, I want to hear what my Rav is speaking about in his sleep. So he got close to him in order to hear what he's whispering, and Ari HaKadosh woke up. Hmm. When he woke up, Rabbi Chaim Vital said, Mechila, Rav, I'm so sorry that I woke you up. But I heard you speaking. What were you saying? So Arizal said, when I went to sleep, my neshama went up. And when I went up, I was listening to the Torah that they were studying in Gan Eden. share with me a chidush? You were now there studying with angels. Share with me something. It's that Arizal started to laugh. He said, if I was to try to teach you one chidush that I learned up there, it would take me 70 years. That 70 years of straight study in order to explain one chidush, one study that was going through the mind of Arizal at each and every moment. Abuta, it is a knowledge that we can't explain. But Arizal was not just a man of knowledge. He was also a man of miracles. We, the angels were like people to him. It said at one time in Tzudah Shilishit, there was a Rav that was trying to speak of the Vrai Torah and he was trying to teach while Arizal is sitting amongst the Kahal and he decided to speak about Lavan. We know who Lavan, who was Lavan? Lavan was the father-in-law of, of Yaakov. And we know that Lavan cheated Yaakov with 100 uh, lies that he made. That 100 lies, Lavan lied to Yaakov. 
So this Rav was explaining those 100 lies. In the middle of the drasha, Arizal gets up and he starts to laugh. So the Rav said, Arizal is laughing at my Dvar Torah. Why is he laughing? So he looked at him and said, you know, Rav, it's already so hard to speak Divrei Torah in front of you because you know everything. But you're laughing at what I'm saying? He says, no, 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 no. Chas v'shel. I was not laughing at what you're saying. It's that when you started to speak about Lavan, who came down from Shamaim? Lavan. And he was escorted by two angels. And these two angels were holding him down and they were listening to all the lies, all the, 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 the way that Lavan cheated Yaakov. And every time you mention another lie that he did, Lavan sat down and said, wow, I did that too. And every time they, that, that he admitted to a sin, the angel gave him a hit. But one of the things he said was not 100% correct. Lavan didn't truly do that lie. And the moment you mentioned the sin that he didn't do, he got up and said, what a shame I didn't do that when I was alive. So Ari HaKadu said, I laughed to see how the Rishayim, even when they leave this world, they are still in that path. Abu Ta'arizal was not a tzaddik. He was half in this world, half in the next, controlled half in the next, and controlled this world. It was above of what we consider to be a person, above what we consider to be a tzaddik. But you know, Abu Ta'arizal, that was not what Arizal stood for. It wasn't for Limud Torah, it wasn't for miracles, it wasn't for speaking with angels. His tachlit, his tikkun, his mission in this world was something completely different. What was that we ask? So there's a story to say. It said one time about that, this story is going to teach us truly who was Arizal and why is it so important, especially on the Ilula of the tzaddik, to connect yourself to the tzaddik. It said one time, Arizal went to the field with his students. And when he got to the field, they sat down in a circle and they were doing it about the do. They were in deep study of Kabbalah. And next to this field, what was there, Rabbi Aaron? A lake. A lake. While they're sitting down, they see that they're Rabbi Arizal. Now, we have to understand how old was Arizal at the time. We know Arizal passed away at what age? 38. 38, he filled 39. But 38. At an age of 38, he already did all what he did. At the age of 38, he already had students which were, which were 80, 70, 90 years old. So he was mamash, maybe 20 years old at this time, maybe even younger. While they're sitting down, they see that the Rav, the young Ariza, gets up. And he goes and he walks towards the lake. And they see that his face is white. He's shocked. And suddenly they see that he's looking down and he's talking to someone. But they don't see who he's talking to. So they're trying to figure out what is happening. They see they're having a conversation with an imaginary person. They say, what is going on here? Arizal comes back after a few minutes and he's shocked, he's white. When you see somebody, when he gets shocked, you see how their faces. Arizal was like that. Abichai Vital, his main student, said, what happened? He said, you know, something big happened. So said, okay, explain. He said, while we were sitting here and studying, I heard a voice calling me. Chasid, Chasid. Tzadik, Tzadik, come. And I turned around and I heard that that voice was coming from the direction of where the lake was. So I got up and I followed the voice to hear what it's saying. And when I looked, suddenly, what do I see revealed in front of me? A nishama. That a nishama, a soul, revealed himself to, Abichai, to, to Arizal. It's the Arizal, please save me. Arizal said, save me? Would you, you're in a Shammah, how can I save you? He said, Arizal, we've been hearing that in Shammahim they're announcing that there is a tzaddik, that he's the only tzaddik that could repair our situation. He said, who's our situation? Arizal said that when he looked up and he was looking at the lake, he was not able to see the water. That it was an entire lake in front of him, but he saw nothing but one thing. What was that, Abotei? Neshamot. Neshamot. That Neshamot covered the entire face of the earth. That the Neshamot were from where he stood until as far as he could see. It said that the trees, you were not able to see the green, you saw only Neshamot. Ariza said, what is all this going on? What, what is all this? This Neshama explained to Abotei something big. We know Abotei that when people come down to the world, this is what we're going to speak about in a few minutes. They come down for a mission. We all come down for a mission. When we're not able to repair that mission, what does the Kadush Baruch do? 
He does Gilgul, reincarnation. And what if that reincarnation doesn't go well? So what does he do? Another Gilgul. And if that doesn't go well, another Gilgul. And like that, HaKadosh Baruch Hu tries to give the, the Nishama another chance to repair itself. But at a certain point, HaKadosh Baruch Hu admits that this Nishama is lost. So what is HaKadosh Baruch Hu going to do with a lost Nishama? So Zohar Kadosh says, he takes that Nishama and he has no choice. He sent it down to the world. And the, world, the Nishama floats in the air of the world. That Nishama has no reparation. It simply waits until something will happen. Someone will come and repair it. But the problem is, the main way of repairing a Nishama, Rabbi Weber doesn't speak English, but Nishama is soul. So whenever we say Nishama, it means soul. But most probably everybody knows what the Nishama is, just to make sure. That we know about Taya, the Taya Beta Mikdash. Whenever there was a neshama that was sent to the world to float, to go to exile, how would he come to a reparation? Through the korbanot, through the sacrifices. That whenever Beta Mikdash would perform a sacrifice, when the sacrifice would go up to the sky, the neshama would have a chance to grab onto those sacrifices and to use the right to go up to Shamayim. That that was their only way to repair themselves, hold on to the nishamot and go up. But for 1,500 years or so, there was no korbanot, Beit HaMikdash was destroyed. So for 1,500 years, all the nishamot that were sent down to the world with no preparation, just gathered and gathered and gathered and gathered and gathered. And after 1,500 years, one neshama, one tzaddik, which was at the level to do tikkun, which was at the level to repair any nishama in the world. Who is that tzaddik avotai? Arizal. That Arizal was the first one in 1,500 years that was able to repair all the nishamot that are floating in there. The Gemara says that if we were able to see how many nishamot float around us, a man would not be able to, to stand alive. And Arizal, it said that before he passed away, there wasn't a neshama in the world that was not repaired. That he repaired all the neshamot that existed. Everyone. It said about that, that every Friday night, he would leave the city, and he would go to a mountain. And on that mountain, he would take a couple of big uh, tzaddikim, big uh, tanaim, which we all know their name, like uh, Rabbi Yosef Karo, Rabbi Moshe Cordovero, which were simple people amongst that group. And uh, today we look at them, the tzaddikim who they are, giants. And they would stand on the mountain and they would do the prayers of the entering of the Shabbat. And Rabbi Chaim Vital says that when they would do the prayers, they were not able to see the sky because when their tefillot would go up to Shamayim, what would happen? All the neshamot would grab onto their prayers and it created a wall of neshamot. From the ground to the sky. Abu Taib, you only try to, to, to imagine who Arizal was. That Arizal's main purpose, Arizal's neshama, was built for one thing. Tikkun, reparation. You know, but a lot of people come to me, and they tell me, you know, Rav, I'm going to Eretz Israel one week the first time. And because I have a limited travel time, what should I go? What do you advise me to, that it's a must go? And I think I even I told you that. I have an option. Either I go to Yerushalayim, or I go to Tzfat. Which one do I take? I go to the Kotel or I go to the Tzadikim of Tzfat? I always tell them, if you have one option to go to either or, you go to Tzfat and you go to Arizal. Why is that? Because Abutai, if we go to the Kotel, if we don't have fear of Akadosh Baruch Hu, we're going to an, an ancient site. There's nothing that can turn on a spark in our heart. There's nothing that can pull us in to start something positive in our life. To go to Arizal, to go to the Neshama, that its main purpose was repairing other Neshamot, it could start a spark. It could start something in our Neshama. We know about that every single Neshama has a different characteristics, have a different mission. Your Neshama could be giving tzedakah, your Neshama could be teaching Torah, your Neshama could be Achnas HaTorchim, your Neshama could be spreading Torah. Arizal's Neshama was to do what? To repair Tikkun. And that is why Rabotai, Arizal, and especially the Ilula of Arizal, is such an important day. 
You know, Abu Tai is something that we mention every single Ilula. That the Ilula is not just a regular thing. We take the word Ilula, and I mention this a lot, a lot, a lot, Abu Tai. What's the word Ilula in Aramaic, which actually comes from the Zohar? What's the word Ilula? No, Abu Tai. Wedding. That in the Zohar Kadosh, the word Ilula comes from the word Khatuna. Wedding. Why is that wedding? Why Ilula is Khatuna? You could say that the day that he passed away is the wedding of the Tzaddik. How does that make sense? So Zohar Kadosh says, when you go to a wedding, what do you do? You bring with you what? Yes. Gifts. You bring honor. You honor the bride. You honor the groom. You honor them with gifts, with money, with pride, with kavod. In that same very way, on the day of the Ilula, on the Khatuna of the Tzaddik, the day that he passed away, all Malach Hasharit, all the angels, all the Tzaddikim, Akadosh Baruch Hu, goes to the Tzaddik and gives the Tzaddik big gifts. But the Tzaddik has no use for these gifts. What will the Tzaddik do with all these gifts? So what does he do with them? He comes down to the world and he waits to see who will come forward and ask for something that he will be able to grant. But on the day of the Ilula, we have not only the merit to receive blessings, to receive all our, 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 our wishes, all our prayers heard in the merit of that tzaddik, because he had power in that day. Where it said, Nigmarad, Mesech Tchulin, Peish Zayin, Gedolin, Tzadikim, Bemitatam, Me'asher, Mechayem. The tzaddikim are bigger when they're not alive than when they're alive. So not only that we could achieve all what we want for, but also the connection, the access to the tzaddik is there. And what better tzaddik to connect ourselves to than Arizal? The neshama, that its pull is reparation. The neshama, that what it takes out, the energy that it, what's the opposite, absorb? Deflect. Deflect. The energy that deflects is tikkun, it's reparation. And that abotai is something that is very important. Before we start the shiur, I want to speak about two minutes of really rabotai, something important that is lost in these generations. And what is that, Abotai? I'm referring to the concept of tikkun, the concept of reparation. You know, Abotai, when we come down to the world, what do we come down to the world for? Tikkun. So we don't just come down to the world to go to sleep, to eat, to work, to bring kids, to work again. We come down to the world for what? For a mission. We come down with something that we need to accomplish. And Akadosh Baruch Hu gives them a man the time that he needs to accomplish his mission. But I have a question. Yesterday I asked this question and ended up being Baruch Hashem a disaster for me. Baruch Hashem. But how many people in this Kahal, in this entire week, not even today, in this entire month, sat down and thought, am I working on my mission that I'm supposed to? Am I accomplishing what I, why I came down to the world for? Am I doing what I'm supposed to in this world? Akadosh Baruch gave me a mission to complete. Am I doing it? Or am I still living a, a life that has no meaning? No, I want to answer. I, I, I really want to know. Did anyone have that thought this month? Hmm? I want to answer. I, I want really to hear how many people really. No, I want to answer. Rabbi Aaron, you have it every five minutes, you call me and you, uh, <laughs> and you speak to me about that. Am I doing what I'm supposed to? Am I not? What should I do? Okay, no Rabotai. Anyone else? How many people? You, Baruch Hashem. So I don't what, 50, 60 people? Two people? So is, then, then, then you learned what Shlomo Melech says that it's better to go to an Alvayad and the Simchat to remember that we have a mission to do. No Rabotai. I have come, no, about 50 people, only two. And that is why, Rabotai, it's important to speak about this very important concept, which is the tikkun. You know, Rabotai, a lot of people throughout their day to day life, they get lost. They're so busy with work, with their problems, with panasa, shalom bait, that they completely forget that they're supposed to be doing something that they completely forget that they, they have a yehud, they have a purpose in this world. And they get so busy with this, with shtuyot that mean nothing, that it, their time is wasted. 
And a lot of the time, Rabotai, when we think about Tikkun and whether or not we're doing what we're supposed to, there's a thought that comes to our head. Worse comes to worse. If I don't repair what I'm supposed to, what's going to happen? Gilgul, a reincarnation. We rely on that. We say, no, don't worry. I can rest now. When I come back as a different person, I won't remember this. And I'm going to have to start repairing from there. That we, we rely on the fact that we have Gilgul. You know what the Zohar Kadosh says? That many tzaddikim, they were offered the opportunity, or any nishamot, that get the opportunity to either go to Gehenam or to come to back to Gilgul, they choose Gehenam. Because about that, we don't, we're not, it's not certain when it comes up to the teaching of the Gilgulim. And I'll explain why. I'll explain why it's not so certain. You know, Abotai, that all the Nishamot that come down to the world, they are not, none of them are new. We are all old, old Nishamot that keep on coming back as a Gilgul and a Gilgul and a Gilgul in order to repair what we're supposed to repair. But Abotai, it is not Muvan Me'elav, it is not Muvan Me'elav. English, Muvan Me'elav. Huh? It's not guaranteed that we come back as a Gilgul as another person. That we rely on the fact that we say, if I don't repair, I will come back as another person and he'll deal with it. The Zohar Kadosh Abutai teaches us that reincarnations, Gilgulim, can be done not just by people. That reincarnations can sometimes come down as animals. Where it said that the person does Lashon Ara, he comes down as what? As a dog. And a person that sees not good vision, the things that you're not supposed to see, comes down as a bird. And even worse than that, you're not only able to come down as an animal, you can come down as a tree. Or even another level worse, as a stone, as a domem, as a piece of metal. That you need to sit there and wait for someone to come and to repair your nishama to repair your tikkun. That it's not in your hands to get up and to do it. That it's in someone else's hands. And the most scary part of Botai, that the Zohar Kadush says, does anyone here remember the Gilgul? Who they were in the past life? Does anyone? Okay, the Zohar Kadush says, that as people when we return, Kadush Baruch does this chesed, this kindness, that he makes us forget our previous Gilgulim. But if you come down as an animal, or if you come down as a tree, or if you come down as a stone, you remember your previous Gilgulim. That an animal, a dog, could sit there and remember who he was. He was a king, maybe, in his previous life. But now he's stuck in the body of a dog. And he sits there and he regrets and he waits and he prays for something to happen, for a tzaddik to come by and to do him tikkun. That the Zohar said, the moment where a nishama leaves a person's body and the sun can no longer shine on his body that we can feel it, at that moment, the regret starts to come in. Because at that moment, it's uncertain where he's going to end up for the next thousand years. Because there are many stories about Tai with Baal Shem Tov. We're not even going to get because I want to go to my shiur. I want to continue the shiur. But there are so many stories about Baal Shem Tov, about frogs, about dogs that came back hundreds of years of reincarnation to repair one thing. There's even a story of my grandfather after the shiur will uh, we'll, we'll say it with the lion that many of you know it, but my master, it's a beautiful shiur. Rabotai, now we have the opportunity in our bodies, with our moach, with our brains, with our dad, to get up and to repair our own tikkun. And not wait, Rabotai, that it's too late. That we're going to have to let some other person step on our rock when we're sitting on a rock and to do somehow a tikkun. Rabotai, it is in our hands. We need to go and to get it. We need to go every morning to think about, am I doing what I'm supposed to do in this life? So Abotai, I know I already prepared myself. Many of you are asking now. No, I want to do my tikkun. Okay, I was inspired, I want to do my tikkun. But what is my tikkun? No Abotai, what is my tikkun? How can one know what his tikkun is? So the answer that everyone answer is what? Find what's most difficult for you, and that's your tikkun. But you know, Abotai, first of all, Ramay Pano disagrees with that. And second of all, it's a very negative way to look at things. To find 
what's the hardest thing for you, what you struggle with the most, and that's your tikkun, that is completely wrong. Rabbi Aaron, I have a question for you. What mitzvah, when you do, you have the most joy? Fast, no. Okay, we'll come back to you. No, Rabbi Zev. No, what's the one mitzvah that you do, you receive the most joy? Giving. Giving. Zdaka, gimrut chasadim. No, tzadik. Tzedaka. No, rabotai, no, tzadik, you. You. You know what the Zohar says that in today's generation, most tikkunim will be two things, brit and gimrut chasadim. No, you, tzadik, you. What, what mitzvah do you do you receive the most joy from? Singing on Shabbat, perfect. No, you. What's the one mitzvah that you do you receive the most joy from? Tefillin. Okay, perfect. Describe what you feel. You can't? Good. <laughs> Describe what you feel. You can't? Good. Describe what you feel. Okay, describe what you feel. You can't, Nahon. But I think in your head, can you describe what the feeling you have when you do a mitzvah that gives you happiness? No. Why? Because it's not necessarily us. It's not necessarily our body giving us that sense of gratification. Ah, I did something good. I know to describe it. When you eat something that tastes good, you can describe it. Why? Because you know what it is. But here, Abotai, what is screaming that it wants more of? Our nishama. That it's not even our body telling us we want more of that. What is it? It's our nishama. That's why we can't point a feeling of happiness, a feeling of joy. Now I have another question for you, Abotai. Do you feel the same feeling when you sing on Shabbat, when you put a feeling? No. Do you feel the same feeling with the Shabbat? When you put a feeling, you, 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 Yosef, Abraham. Yes. Meir. Uh, Meir, when, when you sing on Shabbat, do you receive the same feeling when you give? Uh, no. No. Uh, what was the feeling? You said the feeling. When you sing on Shabbat, do you receive the same feeling when you put a feeling? It's the same, yeah. You receive the exact same feeling. So why do you say the feeling? What? Yeah, why did you say tefillin? Yeah. If we look at Botai, we'll see that it's interesting <laughs> that you have a group of Jews, Baruch Hashem, and each person is pointing at another mitzvah that that specific mitzvah gives them a pleasure, a joy that he can't even describe. And if we compare the same mitzvah to people that are around us in the same room, we'll see that it's different. Mitzvot. You is thinking on Shabbat, you is tefillin, and you is giving. That if you were to sing on Shabbat, it's not the same thing. Or if you were to put a feeling, it's not the same thing. But when you give, it's a gratitude, it's a feeling of happiness you can just describe. What is that, Abotai? That is our nishama kicking us, telling us one thing. You are doing something that you're supposed to be doing, and you're on the right path. That it's not about finding what's hardest for us and continuing and building on that, on that thing. It's finding what gives us the most happiness, what pulls us, what attracts us, and continuing to perfect that. Because that abotai is your tikkun. That what pulls a person, what attracts a person, it is nishama pulling him. And that's why there's a hard, a hard, a, 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 it's almost impossible to describe the feeling of it. Because it's our nishama pulling us. And abotai, the attraction could be for good and could be for bad. That you could be attracted to a mitzvah, but the same way you could be attracted to a mitzvah and you know that that is your tikkun, it all can also be opposite. That's, some people, you see, they are attracted, they are pulled to do a certain avera. Rabotai, the things that pull us, the things that make us want more, are the things that we need to repair. And the positive ones, what, 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 what must we do? Build on top of that. On the negative ones, what, what, what must we do? Avoid. Reduce. And that abotai is the recipe, the simple answer how one finds his tikkun. Abotai, I encourage everyone to, for everyone, Be'erat Hashim, to take a moment to write it down. That every week, every couple of days, to sit down and to see are they truly doing what gives them that pure pleasure, what gives them that pure attraction that they cannot even describe. And I wish everyone, Be'erat Hashim, Abotai, to a big brachan and slachai in this. And may we all, Be'erat Hashim, Abotai, find what we came down to the world and complete our mission that we're supposed to do. Amen. 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 Now, Abotai, we're going to go to Ashiu.
Last week, Abotai, we started Brachot. So we did Modani, then we did Bracha. We didn't even get to the whole Bracha. We went through the, what, 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 what stage? The name of Hashem. Now, Abotai, after every Bracha, what do we do? No. Amen. Amen. Abotai, what's the explanation of Amen? We say it so many times and no one asks what's the explanation. No, Rabotai. I, I, it's, 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 this shiur, it's a, we're, we're finding the simple thing that we do a hundred times a day and no one, no one ever asks. No. Ex- Rabotai, what the car to, to get involved? What's the answer to Amen? We have to guess. That's what's sad, you know? What's the answer? To, what, what, what's the explanation to Amen? It's just the period. In it, one explanation, another explanation. No, Rabotai. That's it? Let, let, let's continue. So first of all, Abotai, <coughs> to start to explain, a man has very, a few explanations. The first explanation, this is what we're going to talk, because Amen Abotai is something that we do often, and it's important, and it's important that we do it right. Because if we don't do it 100% right, we're not maybe necessarily doing a, pulling its full potential and receiving as much blessing as possible. So first of all, Abotai, a man has few explanations. The first explanation is emet. That when someone gets up and does shakol, baruch ata Hashem, elukenu menech haulam, shakol niya bitvaro, that everything was created by Hashem, what do we say? Amen. Amen explanation is what? Emet. That we're saying that Kadosh Baruch it is true. That the blessing that we did is emet. That's one explanation. <coughs> Another explanation is, it's the first letters of the pasuk, el melech neeman. El alef. Melech, Mem, Neeman, Nun, Amen. That Akadosh Baruch Hu is a loyal king. It doesn't make sense, I know. Ne- w- 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 t- hold on. And the third explanation is what? The third explanation is Ratzon, That we pray, it's the, it's, 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 it's translation is that Be'ezrat Hashem, the Geula will be built, and Akadosh Baruch Hu will return the world to its original state. Amen. So, Abotai. Three explanations on the Amen. But still we don't understand what we're supposed to think when we say Amen. And that Abotai is what I want to speak about. What do we need to have in mind when we say Amen? As well as what's the importance? Abotai, it can bring us so much bracha. Or chas v'shalom, it, it can take us to very bad places. So first of all, Abotai, if we take the word Amen, Gematria, no. 91. 91. What's Gematria? We take every letter. We take every letter and we take it to its correspondent number and we see what number comes out. Amen is 91. About if we take the shul that we said last week and we take the two names of Hashem, Avaya, Yudke Vavke, and Adonut, Adoshem. And we take both of those words and we put them in Gematria. What comes out? 91. And that abotai is the meaning in the explanation of Amen. That Amen is when you take the Havaya, Yud Kei Vav Kei, and you put it together with what? With the Adonut, Adoshem. That when you put both of those names together, and this is what we're going to take five minutes abotai and repeat we did last, last year, we are essentially bringing both kingdomships of Akadosh Baruch together. So we explained abotai last week that there are four worlds that exist. Atzilut is the highest. Beria, one level under. Yitzira, one level under Beria. And Asya. Asya breaks to how many pieces? Two. It's one world, but broken to two prinot, two perspectives. One perspective, which is Ruchani, spiritual. So it's like the other four worlds, the other three worlds. And the second perspective is what? Gashmi, physical, material. Which is what, Abotai? It's this world. All those four worlds, Abotai, were connected as one. Like we said last week, Adam Arishon, he was a man, but even though he was a man, when the world was complete, he was able to talk to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, he was able to talk to angels because the worlds were together. But the moment Adam Arishon, the moment Adam Arishon sinned with the tree of knowledge and B'nai Israel sinned, with the golden calf. What happened in that moment, Rabotai? 
the world split. Where the world of Asia got split to two pieces, which is two different worlds, which is the spiritual and the physical. That actually, our world is disconnected from the higher worlds. What will happen in the time of Geulah, when Mashiach will come? HaKadosh Baruch will take the two worlds and put them together. What's the explanation of that? Reparation, tikkun, bringing the Geulah. Because the moment that both worlds come together, that's when the Geulah is here. Because the spiritual perspective of Asiya comes down and cleans this world. So it's all about Abotai repairing both of those worlds. There are two names of kingdomships of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. One kingdomship, which is hidden, which is Yud Kei Vav Kei, Havaya, and we can't, even re- we can't even pronounce it. We see Yud Kei Vav Kei, it's really Yud Hei, but what do we say? Yud Kei, because we're not even allowed to pronounce even the spelling of the letters. And the second one is, which that is hidden, Nistar, and then there is the Nigla, the revealed, which is Adunut, Adoshem, where we're allowed to see it, read it, and say it. Both of those names represent both kingdomships. The hidden one <coughs> represents the kingdomship of HaKadosh Baruch Hu up there, and the revealed one represents HaKadosh Baruch Hu where? Down here. Abotai, what is our job? Our job is to take both of those worlds and put them together. That our job in reparation, in doing our tikkun, in doing our part in the reparation, is to bring those worlds a little bit closer one to each other. That the moment that they are clo- that they come in, they connect each- to each other, what happens? Giula. And that is our job, redemption. That the redemption will come when we put those two names together. When we read the Sidurim Abotai, we do any bracha, that's what we said last week. What do we find? We find that it says Yud Kei Vav Kei, Havaya, but what do we pronounce? Adonut, Adoshem. Why is that? Because Abotai, when we do a bracha, and we mention the name of Hashem, and we have in mind Havaya, Yud Kei Vav Kei, and Adoshem at the same time, meaning we have in mind that I'm saying one, but I have in mind the other. When we do that, what are we essentially doing? We are connecting both worlds. We are tying both worlds and making them close to each other. That that is the tikkun. Abotai Amen, which is the gematria of both of those names, is that exact concept. Which whenever we said last week about connecting the both worlds when we do bracha, applies when we do Amen. When a person does Amen, what does he need to have in mind? Both of those names. Adoshem, which is Adonut, this world, and Havaya. And when we bring those names together, we make Adoka Adosh Baruch Hu's name bigger and his kingdom bigger in this world and in the next. The Zohar Kadosh Abotai, the Parashat Vaishlach, says something Abotai incredible. A little bit scary, that's the truth. The Zohar Kadosh says that the person that does not know how to put both names together, and when he does Amen, did not know the need to think of both of those names at the same time, Adif Shelo Nivra, that it's preferred that that person like that should have never been created. Because a person like that is not doing what he's supposed to do in bringing the words together. Abi Uda continues on and explains a little bit more. He said, Son Chas Shalom, that it's a person that didn't know, period. Like, like most of us here, that we didn't know that Amen is Avaya and Adushem together. It's a person that knew that there is something to repair in Amen, but didn't learn, didn't study, didn't chase it. That a person that knew such a thing, but didn't go and chase it, and didn't always, when he said Amen, think of both of those names, a person like that, it's better that he was never created. Abiyu Da continues, and he says about that something amazing. He says that when a person does not think of both of those names at the same time when he does Amen, his appearance in Shamayim, in the upper and higher worlds, is nearly invisible. He becomes small. That suddenly a person could be living here, but up there he means nothing. He can pray, and his prayers are invisible. Sometimes about that we pray, and we feel that like we're praying to no one. 
We feel that our prayers are going to the air and no one's even receiving them. You receive a feeling of, of, of miscommunication. The Zohar Kaddush says it's very simple. When your appearance becomes small and close to nothing in the higher worlds, how do you expect your prayers to mean something? That if we want our appearance to be big, if we want our prayers to be strong, we need to strengthen our appearance. Why is that Rabotai that when we say Amen and we mention both names at the same time, our appearance becomes stronger? Because the Zohar Kaddush says that when we say Amen and we think about Hashem and Avayat together, we're not just bringing Ichud. What's Ichud Rabotai? Unity. When you take two things and you put them together. Like we said last week, when a wedding, when a Chatan and Kala go together, what are they called? Ichud. The two are coming together. When we think of both names of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, when we say Amen, we're not just bringing both of the names of HaKadosh Baruch Hu together. We are actually bringing the Tiferet and the Malchut back to Achibu, which Tiferet and Malchut are two of the Sfirot, two of the attributes that HaKadosh Baruch Hu created in the world. Rabotai, we need to understand what happens in Shammai. Because this is see that a lot of people have a little bit of a hard concept of getting to that thought of this Yichud, uh, the bringing the words together. So there is, and I will explain one moment. There is what Kadosh says, Rabotai, that when you bring the Tiferet in the Malchut together, what happens? All the worlds get blessed, and all the angels receive blessing. And the Zohar Kadosh says that we cannot describe, and the Zohar says, we cannot describe the happiness that the angels have when a person does such a thing. That when you have in mind, Rabotai, it's something so simple, so, so simple but so big. When you say Amen, you have to think of both of those names. The joy that we give the angels are undescribable. Why is that? So Rabotai, in order to understand this whole concept of Ichud, unity, this whole concept of Sfirot, it's simple. In this world, Abotai, what do we have? We have something in the nature that we know that the nature is built on what? The nature is built on the higher world, on Olam Ha'ilion. In the nature, we have something that's called an ecosystem. What does that mean? You have many different animals, many different lives, sources of life. We'll give it a more uh, general name. That each one does one act that supplies something that gives life to another. That ecosystem is essentially not one being, not one source of life. It could be 10, it could be 100, it could be a thousand lives that each one is leaning on the other. That the act of one gives life to the other. And, act, and, and, and the life of that one, does, uh, he, he, the fact that he has life, he could act, and he gives life to another. That everyone is relying one on each other. It's like a body, many organs. If you take one of those animals out, if you take one of those sources of life out, what do you create? Imbalance. Imbalance in the ecosystem. Why? Because the animals, the life that are supposed to receive life, is no longer receiving life. Because there is no nature of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Now, but the world up there is an ecosystem. But it's an ecosystem of Sfirot, of different sources of life. It's the same thing, Abotai. But the problem is, Abotai, is what at the time when Adam Marishon did the sin, what did he do to the words of Abotai? He made them separate. He made them break apart. That suddenly it's like taking out one of the lives of the ecosystem. What do you create? Misbalance. That suddenly the nature is not able to continue in its normal matter. That now suddenly animals that usually eat, what happens to them? They starve. The trees that usually grow die. Why? Misbalance in the ecosystem. When Adam sinned, he created the biggest misbalance in the ecosystem that could exist in Olam Ha'ilam. And when we bring two sources of life together, what are we doing? Repairing that ecosystem. And every time we put another link into the ecosystem, what happens? Life continues to flow from one piece to another. Abotai, it is the exact same thing up there. When we bring the Tiferet, which is the source of life, and the Malchut, which is the source of life, together, what happens? Life that regard those two could continue to move on. In our situation, how is it explained by? By the angels receiving life. That the angels suddenly 
are able to receive the light, receive the life that they're supposed to receive. The Rakadosh Baruch created the ecosystem, and now they're getting back. And that's why the angels have such happiness. And the person that is able to repair that ecosystem, those angels have what towards him? Akaratatov. They owe him. He's repairing their world. A person that repairs their world, you, will you not notice him? Of course you'll notice him. It's like people in the shoes that want to ask questions. It's impossible to not notice him. He's always there. So a person that brings life to all the worlds, the Malachim notice him. Resulting in what? Him having a presence in Shammai. The Zohar says that the person like that, a person of what is the simplest thing, when he says Amen, puts Avaya and Adushim together, a person like that receives blessing in this world and receives blessing when he leaves this world. Why is that? What's the blessing in this world? It says that the blessing in this world is whenever that person is going to be in a tough situation, which we all are. Sometimes it could be with work. Sometimes it could be with, we feel a, a thing not going our way. It could be with health. It could be with shalom bayit, peace amongst the family. And when we are in these hard situations, what do we do? We pray. When your prayer, a man that is able to put all those lives back into the ecosystem of HaKadosh Baruch when your prayer goes up, the Zohar says that the angels get up and they announce. And they say, they say open the gates fast to allow the prayer of this Shomer Imunim to enter. That this man has the title of Shomer Imunim. He is not like any other man. He has the stamp of Shomer Imunim. What is Shomer Imunim? I'll explain it before I move on to, to the next thing. Shomer Imunim, Abotai, first of all, the word Shomer. What's Shomer in English, Abotai? Guard. Guard. That he is the guard of what? Of the Imunim. What is Imunim? The Zohar says Imunim, Milashon, Emuna. Imunim is from the word Emuna. That him is a guard for looking where, he, where a person does a bracha and ought to answer Amen. A strong Imunah. But the Zohar says, don't call it Emunim or Emunah. Ela Amenim, the guard of the Amen. That the person Abotai, and this happens to us all the time, Abotai, that we hear suddenly that someone's doing a bracha, and we stop what we're doing and we wait. It could be a conversation that we're having and we wait to hear the bracha to answer Amen. And a person that waits for the exact correct time, because we know that the Amen cannot be a second earlier, which is called Amen Khatufa, a stolen Amen. Because it's not the time when you already said Amen, you stole it. And it cannot be a second late, meaning a, a certain period of a, a, a time after the Bracha, because that, what is that called? Yetoma? A uh, yetoma, yetoma in English? An orphan Amen. That the Bracha was 10 seconds ago, and now you're asking Amen. So he's alone, he, he, goes, he, fl he floats in the air. That the person that guards any opportunity to answer Amen, and he waits, and the moment that there's a man, he's the first one to jump and to stop what he is doing and answer Amen. He has the title of Shomer Imunim. Shomer Imunah, Shomer Amenim. The guard of the Amen. And a person like that, whenever he goes to if it's filah, if it's he needs something, if it's something bad that fell upon him and he wants Akash Baruch to cancel it, that person has a special title that the angels open up the gates for him. Because the angels have a Ka'atatov. They owe him. And what's the gift that he receives after 120 years? The gift that he received after 120 years, <coughs> that it said that when his neshama goes up, all the angels, which we know about the Zohar, says that when we pass away, our neshama has an entire journey that he needs to go through. That we don't just pass away and go to where we're supposed to. Our neshama has a journey where some say that it takes years for our neshama just to get to the court. Just to be judged, it takes years. When a person like that passes away, the angels, they say, bring that Shomer Imunim. Bring that man that always was a guard for the Amen, always ran. The moment there was a man to jump in to say the Amen, bring him up fast. Don't let him wait. We owe him a favor. We owe him to return the favor. Which Abotai is something amazing. There's another Zohar Abotai that says a beautiful story about Rabbi Shomer Yochai. That this is going to take us to our next uh, lesson. So that is Abotai, that one time, Rabbi Shon Yochai, we know Abotai that these big Tanaim, all these big Tzadikim, they were not fond, fond? 
fond. fond of staying always in this world. But all the big tzaddikim, you hear about them, they, they love to go up to the Neshama, to the higher world, and study Torah from the highest places that exist in the higher world. The Zohar Kadosh says, page Kuf Samer Bet, Amud Aleph, the Rabbi Shomba Yochai, one day, went up to Shammai with a group of students. Neshama, of course. And when they went up, Rabbi Shomba Yochai was courageous, he was ambitious. And the Zohar says that they were climbing from one level to another to try to reach the highest level they, where they could possibly reach. And the Zohar said that they reached to a very high level in Gan Eden, that there they saw an angel that was standing, and a big voice was, was screamed to that angel. And that voice said one thing, Kol ha-ma'arich, ma'arichim lo, v'kol ha-mekatser, mekatserim lo. That the person that, 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 that makes long, doesn't say what, that makes long, they will lengthen him. One that cuts short, they will cut short for him. The Zohar Kadosh said, when Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai heard this, he was curious. He said, what, what is this pasuk? What is this voice saying that doesn't make sense? But the moment he had that question, the Zohar said that angel saw him, and that angel ran to him, grabbed him, and said, get out of here. <clears throat> that the angel grabbed his hand and said, you're not allowed to stay in this level of Ganeden because this level is a very high place. So Rabbi Shimon Bar said, I'm going to leave. But before I leave, one thing tell me. What was the explanation of that pasuk? And do you understand what that voice said? So that angel said, I actually understand what it meant. And I'll tell you, because you're Rabbi Shimon. He said, Kol amarich. One, when he hears Amen, he screams, Amen. And he makes it long. That the Amen is a very, very long Amen. A person like that, what are they going to do to him? They're going to make a, him a long life. One that makes long, they will, make it, they will lengthen him. But the same way that he answers Amen and he says it with a loud voice and he makes it long, they will take his life and they will stretch it and make him a very long life. But one that has for Shalom answers Amen, Amen, no finish. He wants to just get go over it because he knows that, he, that the man is looking at him to say Amen. The person that cuts the Amen short, what do they do to a person like that? Has for Shalom, has for Shalom. They cut his life short, has for Shalom. Rabotai is something that is scary. But there is Rabotai a little bit more severity. And I, and I want, Rabotai, you know, truly Rabotai was thinking today, I said, what can I do to make sure that everyone that they leave this shiur, they will keep this concept of answering Amen for every Baha, but not only answering Amen, answering Amen correctly. So Akadur says that the same way when we answer Amen and we do it in the right way and we do it with the right intention, those malachim, those angels, they owe us a favor. Nahon? That they are obligated to return back the good that we gave them. But Zohar Kadosh says in, this, in that exact same manner, if a person doesn't answer Amen, those angels say, why should we give to a man that never gave us? How should we go out of our way? Why should we go out of our way in order to help this, this person? The Zohar says when a man like that that doesn't answer Amen. He hears Amen but ignores it. And he does it openly. A person like that, when every prays to Shamayim, what do the angels do? The angels go to make him revenge. Which is scary. That the angels go and they scream, close the gates for the prayers of this man. Because the same way that he closed the gates and closed the opportunity to send us life by putting the Tiferet and Amalchut together, we're going to close the gate of Tefillot for him. Where the Zohar even says that after 120 years, when his Neshama comes up to Shamayim, and he goes through that entire journey to go up, to be judged, to go to the next step, what do the angels do? They do the exact same thing. When they say, close the gates, we want this Neshama to stand outside, to see what it felt, that we have a man that can open the gates, there's an opportunity to give us life, but to sit and not do anything about it. It's like a Buddha, you know what it's like? It's like a king, or even a man, that, uh, that, that is standing behind the gate, and he's asking his close friend, open the gate. And he says, no, I'm not going to open the gate. Why? Because I'm holding the control. When the table will turn, 
And you, when, when, and you will get back to his position. What will he do? And act for an act. The same way you act with me, I'm going to act with you. It's a very simple, it's not a judgment, thought, we shouldn't think negative. It's a very simple thing. But before I finish explaining the severity, it's true, I want to go to the worst. And this tree of the will show us how on one side it's important to say amen, but also, meaning what the blessing we receive when we say amen, but also what happens when we don't say amen. We know Abotai, after 120 years, chas v'shalom, chas v'shalom. If a person went up to Shamaim and he acted not in the path of Hashem, but he went against the Torah, he went against the mitzvot, where does he go to? Gehenam. But Abotai, a lot of people, when they think of Gehenam, they see this as Akarosh Baruch Hu revenging a man for not going in his path. You do good, I send you to paradise. You do bad, I send you to punishment. Which, which Rabotai, that is not the case. Gehenam Rabotai is actually a gift for many Neshamot. Why is that? Because Gehenam is an opportunity for a Neshama to enter into a place, a Neshama that did bad deeds, a Neshama that has black spots, and clean those black spots out. That when he finishes cleaning his Neshama, what happens to him? <coughs> no. He leaves Gehenam, he leaves hell, and he enters to Gan Eden. Where the Zohar Kadosh says that every gate of exit of Gehenam, <coughs> what's put right in front of it? An entrance to Gan Eden. Where they say that, that, that they don't want the Neshama that already completed what it's supposed to and already cleaned himself to wait an extra moment. That wherever there's a gate of Gehenam, right in front, there's a gate of Gan Eden. That even further, the name of the gate of Gehenam is the exact same name of the gate of Gan Eden. At the moment they finish what they're supposed to finish, they go straight into paradise and they dwell amongst the Tzadikim. We know about time that what's the longest a person could be sent to Gehenam? 11 months. That after 11 months, every person gets clean and goes up to Gan Eden. But we know about time that every in Gan Eden, there are in Gan Eden also, but in Gehenam, there are levels. There are the high levels, the easy levels, where the heat is light, and there is a deeper level, it's like fire, it's like barbecue. On the top, it's less hot, you go step by step until the bottom, that's where the hottest is. In the bottom of the bottom of the bottom, <coughs> there is a gate. <coughs> this gate is called Shaul Tachtit. That this gate is the lowest gate that exists in Ghanedi. Why is it the lowest gate? Because it's the lowest position, but in that gate, what is there? Another gate, which is the only gate in Gainam, it's the only entrance of, of, in the levels of, of Gainam, which there is a gate within a gate. But this secondary gate, which is in the world of Shaul uh, Tachtit, this secondary level, which is in the level, only has one door. It's a door of what? It's a door of entrance. And there is no door of exit. That chas v'shalom, if a person goes in, there is no tikkun, there is no reparation. What neshama, and Rabbi Mechilat, I'm scaring, but I want to make sure that everyone's going to be like soldiers. What type of people do they send to that gate? People who, this is what the Zohar says, which spit on the face of Hashem, and when they heard Amen, they purposely didn't answer. That people that don't answer Amen, it's like they degrade the name of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. It's like telling HaKadosh Baruch Hu, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, I can repair your world, but I choose not to. So you give me life, you give me everything, you give me food, you give me a roof, but I choose not to help you. I choose not to do the, the essence of reparation, of bringing our Hashem's world back together. So I said that when a Shema goes down there, never returns, but he still has the hardships of Gehenna. It's not even like HaKadosh Baruch Hu sends the Neshama to float. Because you know you float, you float for eternity, but it's not hurting for eternity. But Gehenam, that gate of Shaul, Tachtit, it, you go in, and it's eternity, chas v'shalom, of suffering. The Zohar finishes off with a positive way, positive message. It says, in order for a person to avoid from going down there, it's not chas v'shalom, a big mission. 
It's a matter of one thought of saying, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Mechila for all the times, I could have said Amen, but I didn't. When the Zohar said, it's, it's enough to have one thought of saying, Hashem, from here and on, when I hear Amen, I'm going to say Amen. And for all the time that I didn't answer Amen, Mechila. That one thought, you are, you are already patu, you are already exempt from chas v'shalom having a chance to go down to that place. So Abotai, what are we going to start doing before we, do, we say any bracha? We're going to answer Amen. Because if we answer Amen, we will receive an abundance of blessing. We make our print up there in the world bigger. When our prayers go up, they recognize who the prayers come from because you are a big character at Shammai. But on the other side, we do the reparation and we repair the world the world was lost. You know, Abotai, today's the merit of Arizal. I mean, the merit of Arizal, which is Neshama, was Tikkun, was reparation, bring us all to the point that with every Amen that we do, we will have the thought of Havaya, Yud Kei Vav Kei, Adoshem, Adonut, together. And by doing that, Be'ad Hashem Abotai, we will all do our part in bringing the words together and doing the Tikkun. And with that, Be'ad Hashem Abotai, with the merit, and the merit of Rabbi Chaim Pinto, and the merit of Rabbi Yaakov Bukhatsira, may HaKadosh Baruch Hu Bat Hashem give everyone bracha v'atzlacha v'koma ashe'adeh, may HaKadosh Baruch Hu Bat Hashem spill on us, shefa ad belidai, b'ezrat Hashem, for ones that need panasa, we'll have panasa, for ones that need refuah, we'll have refuah, for ones that need zivug, we'll find their zivug, may HaKadosh Baruch Hu fulfill all our hearts wishes, amen, 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 ברוך אתה אדוני אלינו מלך העולם שהכל נהיה בדברו. אמן. אתה לא יכול. כן, חבר'ה. נכון. אתה יודע, אתה לא יכול לומר את זה כמו שאתה אומר את זה. אני מלמד, אז זה בסדר. אני לא יכול לומר את זה, אז זה בסדר. כי כשאתה אומר את זה פעם אחת, אין ראו, זה כמו בטלה, זה אבן. So what do you have to say? Amen, yeah. amen. Amen, amen, amen. Amen and amen. But just to scream amen for no reason, it's mamash. It's, it's, and the, if you look at, you know, look. Uh, in a, right there. Look, that's the kavanot. The kavanot of Yeshem Rabba. Look at amen. To the left. What did it say? Aleph, Yud, Dalet, K, Nun, Vav, Yud, uh, K. What is that? It's both names put together that it's put together in a manner that we can see it and we can uh, recognize it. So when you say it, you actually are, maybe if it's in your mind or it's not in your mind, you're referring to the two names of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, which shouldn't be said in vain. Oh, wow. Next. Say it. So you're saying, because you're saying the two names is Adonai and the other one is what? We don't say them together. We don't say them at all if it's not for Abba Chak, really. It's, Adoshem. You, it's, it's Adoshem oh. or Adonut. Okay, and yeah. Yud K Vav K. Yud Hey so Stop Vav Hey. Okay, okay, so that's what you okay, so those are okay. Got it, got it, got it. Got it. Uh, you, you can't even put the letters together. That's, that's why what, I have to say stop. Uh -huh, gotcha. So that's what you put them together. No, I would tell you. Nice. That's what you said.